how much is actually enough for me to live comfortably in Singapore. Every time I go out, the expenses add up and it's just more than I budgeted for. My biggest money worry is having not enough money to sustain myself. Being an adult with your money can be tough, but can we make adulting easier by making better financial choices? Joining us at our town hall today is our expert guests in the areas of wealth management, in careers and in property. Okay, let's kick things off today with a question from Faith. Faith, what's your adulting concern you've brought with us today? My question to y'all is that um, how to balance building a career and also uh, raising a family. Also, what should be the financial priorities for someone like myself who's about to start a career? Right, when we talk about balance, it's not about 50-50. It's not that when you have children, you have family, you put in 50% of your time at work and then 50% of the time uh, at home. When we talk about balance, it's really about balancing the tensions of your life um, at different stages. It's really 100-100, right? Because you're at work, you've got to give 100%. When you're at home, you've got to give 100%. And in my own experience, what really worked for me is that uh, my wife subsequently sacrificed and she decided to be a homemaker. In terms of financial priorities, I would say firstly, when you first start out at work, save a lot, right? Uh, don't spend on things that you don't need with the money that you don't have to impress the people that you don't know. Sometimes when we go out and work, you know, we get attracted by buying a car which we may not need and you borrow the money to buy the car thinking that you'll impress people. Actually, nobody is impressed at all. Maybe only yourself, right? So that's the first thing. Uh, save a lot. Secondly, I would say that uh, when you start out at work, it's important to buy suitable insurance to insure yourself because risks will happen and you want to make sure that you have got suitable insurance to cover for those risks. And finally, investing. And I'm not just talking about investing for the future. I'm not talking about the financial aspect of investing. I'm talking about investing in purposeful things, investing in yourself, develop yourself. In life, there are three, three balls that you're juggling, but you only have two hands. Um, and so this is quite philosophical. Two of the balls are made of glass. And one ball is made of rubber. The glass ball, family and health, and the rubber ball is actually your career. So when push comes to shove, put the rubber ball down because the rubber ball can drop, but you can always, it, it bounces back. But your health ball and your family ball, if it breaks, right, it shatters and it never goes back the same way. So when it comes to that balancing act, we have to figure out our priorities. And that was a brilliant question. Um, I'd like for you to focus on the fact that your career is a vehicle to your life, not the other way around. So when thinking about your career strategy, it needs to sit on your life strategy. So what do you want out of life first and try to fit that career into that life strategy and not the other way around? Well, my name is Rabiatul. I'm 24 this year. I'm currently working full-time in the social service industry. So my question would be, what is your investment advice given Singapore's high cost of living and inflation? What are the types of um, investment that you would recommend that is important for all of us and that would ultimately save us money? Yeah, I think when we talk about inflation, uh, I think a lot of us are affected because recently we see you know, Singapore inflation going up beyond 5%. But the truth is that our long-term inflation uh, it's just about 2%. Of course, going forward, I think inflation will stay a bit higher than now. So the first thing I want to say is, let's not be too worried that you know, going forward, the inflation is going to be like what we have been experiencing over the last two years. But having said that, it is important for us to make sure that our money still beat inflation. And one of the best instruments that you can use to beat inflation, which uh, there are enough evidence to show, is equities. Right? So if you invest in equities, it should beat uh, the inflation rate not just inflation rate here in Singapore, but global inflation rate. Of course, the other asset class that can be useful can be real estate. But the problem with real estate is that it requires a huge capital for you to invest in. And for someone who just started out working, uh, obviously, we might not have that kind of capital. And also with property, you might have to take a huge loan. And it's not something you want to do, uh, especially when you just started working. 
And if you invest in property, the other problem is that you are taking concentration risk, right? Because most of your money is into one asset class, and if that asset class fails you, then that's it. You you are not going to get a return, so you might even lose money. So I would suggest that to beat long-term inflation, uh, you might want to consider investing in equities. I'm not asking you to buy uh, into specific stocks. That might not be wise because not many of us, we have that knowledge and the experience to be able to pick the correct stocks. But uh, what you can do is that you can invest in an exchange traded fund. Uh, an exchange traded fund is like a fund, but it is traded on the stock exchange. And just by buying one exchange traded fund, you can actually track uh, markets. For example, you can track the world markets, you can track the MSCI all country world index, which means that effectively just by buying one ETF, you are actually tracking 2,000 to 3,000 stocks. That is, developed, uh, that is invested in the developed markets. Uh, that means US, Europe, Japan, and even the emerging markets. So something that you can consider for you to beat long-term inflation. Well, let's move on to the idea of having children. That's a huge financial commitment. My name is Celine, and I'm 27 years old this year. I work as a comms and media exec and yeah, I also do a bit of content creation. So I recently just got married and I'm just figuring out my new life and just starting the plans for the future. So actually I heard that raising a child in Singapore needs 200,000. So I want to know whether this is like an accurate estimate and also how much do you think um, two people should earn in order to raise a kid in Singapore comfortably? So like we still can have like decent holidays and like still can like maybe occasionally go for restaurants and you know not struggling. Well, firstly, congratulations. Um, I'm not sure whether 200,000 is enough actually. Just the university journey for one child in 20 years time will be about $200,000. And that's not forgetting when they first, you know, go to school, they are preschool. If you want to have children, don't start by doing the financial calculation. You're probably going to be very discouraged and you're not going to have any. I would just say that you spend on your children as much as you can afford it, right? And you make adjustment along the way. I think the starting point of wanting to start a family is whether you feel that having children will make your life complete. Because if you think about it, children have zero ROI. Negative ROI, actually, right? Because you put in everything, your energy and your money, you don't expect them to pay you back. So you will adjust along the way. So uh, don't start with the financial calculation. Hi, I'm Jia Hui. Um, I'm 28 years old and I work in public relations. So um, as I grow older, I've been seeing more people around me getting sick and um, being diagnosed for cancer. So my question is, is around critical illness insurance plans. Um, I currently have a CI rider with AIA, um, but I'm thinking of getting myself better protected. So my question is, um, how much should young adults be spending on insurance plans and what type of plans um, they should buy? The purpose of insurance is not saving and investment because if you want to save and invest, there are plenty of other instruments to do so. The primary purpose of insurance is protection. Right? And because that is the purpose of insurance, you have to treat insurance as an expense right? because you really don't want to use it. Right? So insurance is an expense. And because it's an expense, you want to buy as much insurance as you need but pay as little as you can. How then do you do that? You start first by knowing how long you need then how much you need before deciding how, what type of insurance to buy, right? If you want to buy insurance to replace loss of income in the event that you are critically very ill, how long do you need? Well, you need it only temporarily. You should buy four times of your income. Why four times? Because in that four years, you either recover or unfortunately you passed on. At your age right now, I would say that your priority is to buy that, ins that term insurance to replace that income loss is to buy the hospital plan. I will say that option of alternative treatment as a lower priority because you have other things that you need to plan for.
Um, I'm Bali. I'm 23 years old this year. I'm a year two business management student. As I have a side hustle, I'm a student advisor, financial advisor. So my question today would be on the gig economy. So the context behind this question is that um, in SMU, I'm part of this student financial literacy um, CCA. So where we work with um, poly, IT, and JCs, where we teach them about financial literacy concepts. So when working with like IT students, right, I ask them. So what are your goals? Uh, what do you do after IT? And most of them said either poly or going to gig economy. So that's when I was thinking about it, like how can um, gig economy workers plan for retirement and be financially stable and how can they um, fix their lack of confidence and move into higher paying jobs? I think I will chip in my share on retirement plan. Maybe Yen, you can come in and talk about gig economy because you probably know this better. But I'll say that one thing that gig workers, uh, freelancers, what they don't have is they don't contribute to CPF. Right, and they lose out in that area because when we contribute to CPF, we are not the only people that are contributing. Our employers are contributing, right? And the government gives us risk-free interest rate. So the, the, the people who are freelancers, they don't have that advantage. And so I would really strongly recommend that for people who are gig workers, that they have that discipline to contribute, not just into the MediSafe account, which is compulsory, but they should contribute into their ordinary account and uh, ordinary account as a special account as well. Because you are really a self-employed, you should earn as much income as you can, and then save as hard as you can. Because you are you 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 are the retirement fund, right? There is there is no value to that business. You can't sell it. That's very wise. When I think about um, someone who is running their own side hustle, but that's a word, isn't it? It's a side hustle. So. It, it, it's a it's the level of intensity of how much they will just focus on that one thing or are they going to also find a full-time job and so if you can secure a full-time op, um, role and then you run something on the side which you can keep for the rest of your life and it's wonderful idea for retirement because one of the things that keeps us alive is to keep us active and if you can have something that earns you pocket money until the day you decide to stop it entirely, I think that's great. Um, but on, on the comment about being self-employed versus running a business, I think even as a gig worker, I think it's important for them to constantly be thinking as if they were running a business because it is like, I get an assignment today, it doesn't mean that there's going to be another assignment tomorrow. So they're always constantly in business development mode. I think it's healthy to look for someone who's going to give you repeat business. So it becomes like a core tenant, like a like an organization or, or um, something you can be um, on the stable so that there's always a constant stream of assignments. So if you're in marketing, for instance, there are a lot of digital marketing experts out there who would park themselves with an agency and they would get regular work. And then um, there are also um, people who are professional trainers and they become experts in their field. They are gigging. It means they are running their own um, short-term assignments, but they get regular work from an organization like a hotel association or, or, or an insurance um, financial um, inst institution. Um, and so that would be my, my two cents worth. Um, and again, you're absolutely right about earn as much as you can today because net present value, right? So money today is going to be worth a, long more, a, a lot more in the long run and it compounds. So, yeah. I'm Yang Te, I'm 22 this year. I'm a first year SMU undergraduate. So I run an uh, investment portfolio for myself. And after having some conversation with my friends, I realized that most of them don't actually invest or like find ways to grow their wealth. So my question is, how can we encourage young adults to start investing earlier to grow their wealth? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Even for adults, I think sometimes it's tough to get them to start investing. I think the first thing that you can consider doing is to spend time educating them on the need to invest. Right? I mean, show them. Show them that if they don't invest and if they don't get the returns, they might not get to the objectives that they want to get. So it has got to start with a need. Because without that need, they may not be motivated to do anything. The second thing you probably can do is to also show them and educate them that they actually have the ability to invest. They have the time horizon to invest. Right? And if the, even if the markets collapse today, they have time. They don't need that money today, so they have the ability. But the hardest part, because the need and ability part is the hate part, is the logic part. The harder part is the hard part. 
And the hard part that I'm talking about is their willingness to invest. And why is it that people are unwilling to invest? Well, perhaps they had a bad experience in the past. Perhaps it's their relationship with money. Plus, lack of knowledge. Because, you know, when we don't have knowledge on anything, we will be very unwilling to part with our money. So you might have to spend some time trying to understand what is stopping them and educating them about investment and then hold their hands, go in small. Right? Because if you're going to start them huge, they're going to be very unwilling to do it. But if you ask them to start in a small way, a $1,000, you know, uh, let them have the experience. Uh, they may be more prepared to start investing. And the last thing I will say about this is that prepare them on what is to come. Uh, in my firm, when we take on a client, we tell them that when you start investing, this is what you will experience. You are going to experience volatility. And we're going to explain to them how volatility will be like. It is very much like when you go up a plane. Although you have been up on a plane all the time, the cabin crew will tell you, be prepared for turbulence. And when turbulence happen, you know, you know these things will happen, you know, the captain will come through the mic. Now, even though we have gone through many turbulences, and every time the captain comes through the mic and tells us the same thing, even though we have heard that many, many times, but we just feel assured that somebody is telling us that it's just normal turbulence. Right? Can you imagine the bad turbulence and then the captain doesn't come through the mic? They'll be thinking like, what's up, man? You know, for the first time, he's not talking. Maybe he's dealing with an emergency, right? So it's very important to prepare a new investor what is to come. And then when finally, if it comes, because it will come, because when you invest, it's not a straight line. It's going to go up and down. When it finally happens, go back to them and say, I told you, it's going to happen and it has happened. Nothing to worry about because we have talked about this already. Right, so that's how I think you can prepare and start someone on an investment journey. I'm Jonathan from uh, SMU, studying information systems. Uh, yeah, so my, my question, um, some, some context to um, the question I have, because social media is so prevalent and we have TikTok, Instagram, abundance of information that is coming through. With all the investments uh, options that we have, mm. how can we manage uh, the risk? Yeah, I mean, the internet is a treasure trove of information. There are also a lot of rubbish inside there. <laughs> Plenty of noise, right? So I think we need to be very discerning. My suggestion is first start with developing your own investment conviction, your investment philosophy. So ask yourself whether you are a person that believes that you can beat a market. Or you are a person like me. I don't think I can beat a market because there are enough evidence to show that most active investors who try to beat a the market, they cannot beat it, even the professionals. For those that beat it, they cannot beat it consistently. So if I take that philosophy, right, the next step I will do is then to look for instruments that will be able to do that kind of investment. Then the next step I will take is, how am I going to invest? Do I want to DIY? Do I want to use a robo? Or do I want to find a traditional advisor to do it? Now, once you're very clear with that thinking process, then you go to the internet and look for information that is related to those topics. I would rather someone read the whole book than to read the summary of a book. I would rather someone read the entire text than to just read a short article because you are missing out a lot of context if you, uh, if you do that. I dabbled around with Forex during my poly days and then also in cryptocurrency. And I think these are quite volatile uh, uh, options for investment and I think not only just for myself but a lot of my friends they also lose a lot of um, money and uh, especially some of them they, they might have uh, P PTSD from some of um, some of the failures that they have and the decisions that they made making a better decision I think uh, this is something um, that many young adults like ourselves um, have trouble especially with abundance of inf information that is available on you know, the internet. My son is 26 and he is an accountant, so he's financially trained. But even for him, when he started investing, my advice to him is start by building a core portfolio before you venture into speculative stuff, right? So cryptocurrency is not really recognized as an asset class yet. Start first by buying the simplest thing. Buy the Singapore savings bond. Start with that. 
after you buy the Singapore Savings Bond, buy a T-bill, get experience in buying a T-bill from the market, buy a Singapore Government Securities Bond, then buy an ETF. Because your core portfolio is supposed to be a very safe portfolio that will deliver for you the returns no matter what happens in the long run. So start in a sequence. Uh, don't start straight into something that is so high risk. Let's move on to the next question, which is on CPF from Shu Ting. Uh, my name is Shu Ting. I'm from SMU's College of Integrative Studies, and I'm currently um, year one, 19 years old. Um, so the question I have for you today is, how can Singaporeans leverage on governmental um, incentives and schemes such as CPF and SkillsFuture to improve their financial well-being? Yeah, so CPF is interesting because uh, many people think that the CPF is our current government's idea. Actually, CPF board was started July of 1955, 10 years before our independence. And the main purpose is to provide Singaporeans uh, some social and financial security when they age. Right. So we all know that CPF serves three basic objectives. Firstly, it ensures that you are able to have a fully paid house. Secondly, that you are able to meet your medical expenses. And thirdly, to have a lifelong stream of income when you retire. Right. And it's interesting because CPF can help you now and the future. And at this age, like if, you, if you can, if you have the surplus, you might want to slowly top up your SA. That's probably the only thing I say you can do. Or even your Medisafe account. Right, because the faster your Medisafe account reach, uh, reaches basic health sum, future contribution will now be redirected into your special account. Right? And you will grow. Right? And if you can, put in a bit, even if it's $100, put in a bit into the special account because it's getting you 4 to 5%. Right? And guaranteed, and capital guaranteed, there is nothing out there in the world, sing dollar base, that gives you 4 to 5% guaranteed capital guaranteed, triple A risk, none. But of course, you must accept that loss of liquidity. But sometimes, the loss of liquidity is good. Because if you can put in and you can quickly take out, you won't save anything. Hi, my name is Joseph Tan. I'm 27 years old this year, and I'm currently a marketing professional in an investment firm. So my question is, uh, how do you balance uh, you know, enjoying life and also uh, saving and also investing for financial goals or like buying a house or towards a retirement. And also like the next question would be, you know, there's also a lot of information online about budgeting, tips on budgeting, and then how do you really stick to a plan? You know, there is a Western movement that is coming to, to, to this part of the world and it's called FIRE. I'm sure many of you have heard of FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early and young people want to go on FIRE. They want to FIRE their bosses and, and be on FIRE at the age of 35 or 40 years old. So what they do is that they earn good income, they scream and save everything for the future and they invest aggressively hoping to retire as soon as possible. The only problem with that is that we are assuming that we have a contract with God, that life is going to be like that, but we don't have, right? And so I would say that you earn a good income, yes, be prudent, yes, save your money, but then instead of investing everything for the future, decide the amount that you want to set aside today to do the things that you have to do, the meaningful things that you have to do, because some things you cannot just push it later, especially with aging parents. If you want to you know, bring your parents for a holiday, it's not going to happen when, they are, when you are fired, they might not be around. And for those of us who have children, we all have children, we know our children grow up very, very fast. My daughter is 22 and my son is 26. Today, if I want to go for a family holiday, I've got to book them. And it's so difficult to book them. Even if I'm paying for it, it's so difficult to get everybody to go on a trip. And even if everybody can go for a trip, they have to like the destination I choose, <laughs> right? So some things you've got to do it today. So I would say after you have your surplus, you decide some of those things that you must do today. Then set it aside. Of course, you must have some money that you set aside for the future. So that if life is unfair for you and you go too early, you have lived your life. But if God is kind to you and you live a long life, you have also prepared for the future. Now, if you have more questions about adulting in Singapore, get in touch with us at this address. We'd love to hear from you.